this is part one of three on chapter five. In this chapter, we're gonna be looking at eukaryotic cells and then the different types of microorganisms that have eukaryotic cells. So this is the different types of eukaryotic microbes that we're gonna be looking at in this chapter. And this is table 5.1 out of your book. So there's some eukaryotic microbes that are always going to be unicellular. That means that they're just one-celled organisms. These include the protozoa. Protozoa are animal-like organisms. They have characteristics that are similar to animals, but they don't go into the animal kingdom because they're only unicellular. Because according to the definition of the animal kingdom, animals have to be multicellular organisms. Other eukaryotic microbes that may be unicellular or multicellular include the fungi, which are in the kingdom fungi, and the algae, which are animal or sorry, plant-like organisms, but they're not quite plants. And then the other, the third category on the right-hand side, you can have multicellular eukaryotic organisms. These are in the animal kingdom. And they're officially animals. These are the helminths, or they're also can the parasitic worms. So these are animals. They have a unicellular egg, they have larval forms, and then they can grow up to be adults. So they usually reproduce sexually, a few may reproduce asexually. So we're going to get to these different microbes in a little bit, probably in the second and third part. In this first part we're just going to quickly go over eukaryotic cells and then the parts of a eukaryotic cell, so the structure and function of it. Here is our eukaryotic cell from your book, and we're going to go through all of these different parts, just like we went through all the parts of the prokaryotic cell. As you can see, eukaryotic cells, they have a structure called a nucleus in the middle. It's the big purple structure in the middle, or it's kind of in the middle right hand side. So eukaryotic cells, they have this nucleus, and then they also have other organelles you can see for example, mitochondria, there's chloroplasts, lysosomes, Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum. So we're going to go through those different parts. And we're going to start off with the external structures first, and then we're going to look at the internal ones. So for external structures, you can have the locomotor appendages. These include the flagella. They're covered with an extension of the cell membrane, so they are part of the cell. They're about 10 times thicker than the prokaryotic flagella that we looked at in the last chapter. But they have the basic kind of function, they function in motility. The one thing about eukaryotic flagella is that they whip side to side, so it's kind of more like snake-like action. Whereas if you remember from the previous chapter, prokaryotic flagella, they whip around in a 360 degree fashion. So they do work differently, their structure's different, but they have the same function. Another external structure includes the cilia. These are kind of like the fimbriae of the prokaryotic cell. So the cilia, they're shorter, more numerous, they look like little hair-like structures. They can cover the entire cell. They're found in a group of single protozoans and some animal cells. So they're in the animal-like protozoa organisms and then some animal cells have cilia. They function in motility, so they help the organism move. They can also help the organism with feeding and filtering food out of water. And they also go back and forth. So there's a power stroke and then a recovery. It's kind of like when you go canoeing, you have a power stroke and then you bring the paddle up for recovery and then you do a power stroke. So it just goes back and forth, propelling the cell forward or propelling the water to go by the cell so it can capture food as it floats by. So that's the filtering or feeding part. Another external structure is the glycocalyx. This is the outermost boundary that comes in direct contact with the environment. So the glycocalyx is outside of the cell membrane. And it's composed of polysaccharides. So if you remember in chapter 2 we looked at carbohydrates. One type of carbohydrate is a polysaccharide. It's just a very complex carbohydrate. The glycocalyx, the function is for adherence, so it helps the cells stick together or helps the cells stick to some type of surface. It can also function in protection, 
So it can help protect that cell from dehydration or protect it from other things in the environment. And then also signal reception, it can pick up signals from the environment to help the cell respond. Beneath the glycocalyx, some of these eukaryotic microorganisms like the fungi and the algae, they're going to have a really thick, rigid cell wall. So fungi and algae have a cell wall under the sticky glycocalyx structure. So this cell wall, like I just said, it's rigid. It provides external or support to help give the cell structure and shape. Fungi, they have a really thick inner layer of polysaccharides. So again, it's very complex carbohydrate and it's usually a chitin or a cellulose in structure. Chitin, just to give an example, chitin is what makes up the exoskeleton of insects and lobsters, so it's a very, very hard polysaccharide. Cellulose is found in plants, and cellulose, if you think of celery, it's really stringy, it's the fiber in the plants. So these are the molecules you'll find in the fungi cell wall. In algae, it can vary in chemical composition. So algae can have chitin or cellulose where they're more plant-like, but then some algae have more of a glass or silicon cell wall, so very hard glass-like cell wall. And algae, it just depends on um, the species of algae, and then we a lot of times use the cell wall composition to group algae into different groups for the taxonomy part. And then of course, under the glycocalyx and under the cell wall, if the cell has a cell wall, you have your cytoplasmic or cell membrane. And this has the basic or the same composition as a cell membrane in a prokaryotic cell. So it serves as a selectively permeable membrane. So it allows things to move across the membrane, but it can also prevent things from moving across the membrane. Eukaryotic cells, they also have the cell membrane around or that make up their organelles. So eukaryotic cells have a lot of membranes to them. And just like prokaryotic cells, our eukaryotic cell membrane, it has a fluid mosaic model. So it's mosaic, it has phospholipids, it has proteins embedded in the phospholipids, it can have carbohydrates attached to phospholipids or to the proteins. And then it's also fluid, so these things can move around in your cell membrane. Next, we're going to start to look at the internal structure, so it's really good to get out your book and to follow along in the big eukaryotic cell. So first, we're going to look at the nucleus. So this is a compact sphere in the middle of the cell. It contains all the chromosomes or the DNA in your eukaryotic cell. Inside of your nucleus, there's another region called the nucleolus. This is a really darker area inside of your nucleus and it's where our RNA is synthesized and where the ribosomes are assembled. Our RNA is ribosomal RNA. This is RNA that helps with the function of the ribosome and the ribosome will get to this but it synthesizes proteins. So it's really important to have these ribosomes so you can make proteins. Some of these proteins can be enzymes, they're used in metabolism, other proteins can be used for the defense of the cell and so on. So the main part of the nucleus contains your chromosomes or your DNA inside of it. The next internal structure outside of the nucleus is called the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum, this is a passageway in the cell. And there's two types of endoplasmic reticulum. The first type, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or it's the RER. It's rough. They call it rough because it looks rough under a microscope, and that's because it has ribosomes attached to it. And like I just said, ribosomes, they're used for protein synthesis, and then your rough endoplasmic reticulum, it can modify these proteins once they're created. So rough ER is used in protein synthesis and modification of these proteins. The other type of endoplasmic reticulum is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or the SER. And this is very similar in structure. It's a closed network, but it does not have ribosomes attached to it. So it looks smooth under a microscope. The smooth ER, it functions in nutrient processing. 
synthesis and storage of lipids. So smooth ER is important for lipids, creating lipids, storing them, modifying them. The rough ER is responsible for creating proteins and modifying these proteins. So your two types of endoplasmic reticulum, they're continuous with each other, but they do have different functions to them. So be aware of that. And here's showing the rough endoplasmic reticulum just to show you all of the ribosomes, which are the blue circles. They're attached on the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. And that's what makes it look rough or appear rough under the microscope. And again, rough ER protein synthesis and modification. Another internal structure is the Golgi apparatus. So the Golgi apparatus, it gets proteins from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then it can further modify these proteins, it can store the proteins, and then it can put them in packages and send them out. So the Golgi apparatus, a lot of times I think of it as the post office of the cell, because it's going to um, modify these proteins. Basically it puts little package tags on there, or little addresses and then it sends these proteins out to where they're supposed to go. In the Golgi apparatus, it's just a stack of flattened sacs called Christinae. And that part's not as important. You mostly need to know the function of the Golgi apparatus. So just to review, the parts that we've looked at so far, they make up something called a transport process. And this is how we transfer um, genetic information, how that genetic information is expressed, and how it actually is used to create these proteins that can do different functions. So our transport process, it starts in the nucleus, because that's where we have our chromosomes, our DNA, that blueprint for the cell. Thus the DNA, it goes through something called transcription translation. So that DNA is going to be um, transcribed into um, messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is going to be used by the rough endoplasmic reticulum to make a protein. That protein is sent off to the Golgi apparatus where it can be further modified, it can be tagged. Once it goes through the Golgi apparatus, it's put into a vesicle, so it's going to be sent off to where it's supposed to go. Sometimes your protein is going to be secreted, so it's secreted outside of the cell or it's going to be transported to different organelles in your cell. So this is this process where we take our genetic information, we use it to make proteins, and then we send those proteins off to where they're supposed to go, then the proteins can do their job. Some of these um, vesicles that are coming out of the Golgi apparatus, some of them are created into lysosomes. So these are vesicles, they come off the Golgi apparatus, and they contain special proteins called enzymes. And these enzymes, again I just said they're coming out of the Golgi apparatus, and these lysosomes, when they're completely finished, they function for intracellular digestion. So lysosomes, they can recycle things in the cell, they can break down food items, so they're really important in that part. Other vesicles that come off the Golgi apparatus are called vacuoles. These are membrane-bound sacs. They contain particles that can be digested, excreted, or stored. So there's different types of vesic or vacuoles based on um, what's actually in the vacuole. And then some vesicles are phagosomes. So this is when you have a vacuole merging with a lysosome. So you have the two things at the top merging together. So your vacuole has a particle that needs to be digested. The lysosome has the enzymes that can do the digesting. So they're going to merge together, and then you can break down that food item and get energy out of it. In addition to those important internal structures, we also have mitochondria. They function in energy production. Specifically, it's called cellular respiration. And we'll get to cellular respiration in more detail in the next unit. But for now, mitochondria, cellular respiration produces energy. And the mitochondria has two membrane layers. So it has an outer membrane that's smooth, 
And then the inner membrane, which has lots of folds to it, so it has very high surface area. And that's really important so we can have lots of surface area for cellular respiration to take place on. The other um, energy related organelle besides the mitochondria is the chloroplast. Chloroplasts are found in certain organisms, specifically algae, and then plants have chloroplast. But in, the mit or in our microbes, you're going to see them in algae. Chloroplasts are responsible for photosynthesis. And again, we'll get into more details of photosynthesis later. But for right now, photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast. So we're going to convert sunlight energy into chemical or food energy through that photosynthetic process. Chloroplasts actually have three membranes, so they have an outer membrane, then they have an inner membrane, and the third membrane makes up the thycoloids, which are the green flat stacks that you see in the chloroplast. The thycoloids, they're green, that's where the pigment is stored, that's going to absorb the sunlight energy, that's where this photosynthesis process is going to happen. And then, of course, we have the ribosomes, which I've mentioned quite a bit so far, so hopefully you know what they do by now. Ribosomes are composed of rRNA, so ribosomal RNA, and they're also composed of proteins. And remember that rRNA is made in the um, nucleolus, which is found in the nucleus. So these ribosomes are scattered in the cytoplasm, so they don't have to be attached to anything. They can just be floating around. And other ribosomes are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember that ribosome, that's what makes it look rough, and that's where it gets its name from. And of course, ribosomes, they function in protein synthesis. So they can create all these different types of proteins. Some proteins are enzymes. Other proteins are used for um, cell protection. So lots of different functions for the proteins. And you can go back to chapter two to kind of review proteins, how they're created, and all their different functions. The last structure that we're gonna look at in our eukaryotic cell is the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton is basically what it says. It's a skeleton inside the cytoplasm. So it's just a flexible framework of proteins. Um, there's microfilaments and microtubules. They form this really complex network throughout your cytoplasm. And cytoplasm is that gelatin watery substance that's found inside of your cell. So a cytoskeleton has lots of different functions. It's involved in the movement of cytoplasm and the movement of the different organelles in the cell. It can allow the cell to have this amoeboid movement, so actual movement of the whole cell can be done by the cytoskeleton. And then transport and structural support internally. So you can transport organelles around or transport vesicles around. And then the cytoskeleton can also give the cell shape, kind of similar to how the cell wall gives the cell a shape. But cytoskeleton, it helps with the um, protozoans, it help give, gives them shape, it helps with animal cells to give it the shape. So this was our very quick overview of the different parts of eukaryotic cells. And I would advise you to read through your book again and really focus on the different parts of the cell and what the functions are. So what the job of those different parts is for the overall um, cell itself.